Hello, everyone. We've got the, there we go, we got some microphone action. So, uh, yeah, Emil Grafstra, and uh, let's see if we can get to the, the presentation. There we go, biohacking DIY grinders. So, um, this is Biohacker Summit, so um, I thought the first thing to, to kind of go into was uh, what is biohacking? And we've had a couple definitions on the screen, and I've liked, uh, I like them, but this is my kind of idea. Uh, basically, biohacking is kind of the, the top level, and you separate that out. You have um, you know, the quantified self, the body-mind hacking, life hacks, um, food hacks, all that kind of stuff on the left. Uh, and then way over on the right is grinders. Uh, that's, that's the area that I play in. So in between, we have other interesting things, DNA and RNA hacking, actually modifying the software code of life. That's, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, and 3D bioprinting, taking uh, 3D printing technologies um, and actually cr uh, creating organs, structures uh, for, for the body. It's, it's, all, it's all biohacking. But what they lead down into, kind of on the right side, you got kind of singularity. Um, in the center, uh, you've got life enhancement and life extension. And then uh, on the left, again, you've got quantified self, but it all leads into transhumanism. Uh, so what is transhumanism? And this is a definition that I really, really like. Uh, it's international movement with the goal of fundamentally transforming the human condition. Uh, the, the understanding of death and the, the awareness uh, that, we, that we are mortal and we have limitations and we don't, we, we have the ability to imagine the universe, but a very small, bodies in which to experience it. Uh, so how do we change that? How do we make it better? Um, ever since uh, we picked up tools, we've been transhumanists. Uh, we've, we've imagined solutions and, uh, and used tools to, to affect those solutions, um, using rocks to smash grain, using sticks to get ants, and uh, this is a great picture, um, using tools. The, the tools have evolved uh, along with our idea and understanding of the world. And so, um, you know, that's the, in the 50s, I can't remember his name right now because I'm a little jet lagged, but uh, um, that's, a, a, that's a great example of kind of augmenting the human. Rather than an external tool like a hammer, um, he's, he's actually trying, it's trying to become more hand-like, more human-like. Um, and so, uh, today we have, uh, you know, our wearables um, technology. It's, you know, the uh, Apple Watch, there's all kinds of, uh, you know, gadgets that we have available to us. Uh, to be able to help quantify and measure the world around us. Um, whoops. Let me see if I can get back. Yeah. All right. There we go. So uh, we all have supercomputers in our pockets. Uh, this has been a major change, and it's enabled so much more technology and, and personal interaction and, uh, and a sense of ambient intimacy. So um, we all have the ability to reach out to any one of our 50, 100,000 friends at any given time, and we have a real sense of loss when this device stops working. So um, that, that is this kind of sense of ambient intimacy. We're all cyborgs in some manner because we have this, uh, you know, a device that we just can't live without. And so the, uh, the idea that, um, you know, we, we are all cyborgs kind of comes from, the, uh, from this concept of uh, we're, we're merging man and machine. And there was talk earlier about um, you know, man versus machine, man and machine, men and machines. And um, we, we are all uh, humans and machines today. I mean, there's nothing that, that bizarre about it. Um, so when, uh, when Da Vinci did his perfect man drawing, uh, you'll notice he's not wearing any clothes. He's not wearing a Fitbit. So uh, wh what makes him perfect? Um, so this is kind of going into the philosophy of biohacking in the grinder scene, which is um, the body is an amazing tool. Uh, we, we view it uh, not as a sacred vessel for our souls, but more of like a um, sport utility vehicle. It's uh, flexible, it's, it's rugged, and now it's upgradable. Um, so going into the uh, story of me, this is, uh, this is a key ring that I had, or very representative of one, uh, back in 2005. And uh, I thought about uh, the problem that I had, which is access control. A lot, of, a lot of doors like this, automatically locked. I didn't have access to, uh, you know, I had to pull out this giant key ring, and the process was lame, especially when I had to carry heavy equipment in and out of these doors. So um, very, very quickly, I started thinking about keys and how archaic they are. And uh, they're just cut pieces of metal that identify you as a person to go through this door. And it's uh, 1500s technology. It was really ridiculous. So let's get a little smarter. So I thought, uh, biometrics, I want the door to just know that it's me. So fingerprint, iris scan, that kind of thing. 
Uh, they were all options then, they're still options now, but they're not very good, they're not very robust, and the information is, is you leave it everywhere, like I just left my key right there by touching it. So um, I didn't like the, the fact that um, they were clunky to use, they're still clunky. Uh, what really made sense was RFID, because it's robust, it's very simple, it's cheap to deploy, and fairly reliable. So, um, but I didn't want to carry the card around. It just seemed like another thing to manage. And, and uh, on, the, on the topic of management, uh, we kind of all have these uh, modern day Tomagotchis. Uh, you remember Tomagotchis are in the 90s? Uh, they were little key fob things with a Japanese pet you'd have to like take care of. Kids in school get in trouble, they have to pull them out and feed their pet or it would die. It's a, like a, like a pre-smartphone, pre-Facebook Farmville for, for your keys. So anyway, but the idea is you had to manage this thing. You had to take care for it, feed it, all this stuff. And, and we have that today. We have our wallets, our keys, and our phones. And then if you add more to that, you add Fitbits and other gadgets, there's more management, more burden that you carry every day when you get up and you put this stuff on, you take it off, you have to charge it, you have to make sure there's signal, what's the Wi-Fi password. So um, I really didn't want to have to manage another thing. And so uh, the solution was to uh, implant it. Just like uh, dogs and cats, they uh, get chip implants. Um, so I actually looked at uh, you know, the implants that dogs and cats were getting, but it, uh, it didn't work because it's proprietary. And uh, I wanted it to be cheap and simple and easy and robust and all the things that I wanted the best of both worlds. So uh, I, what I did was I bought a pet injector chip that, that uh, Avid uh, single-use dispenser has a pet chip in it. And I ejected the pet chip, got rid of that, and I sourced and found another chip that I actually wanted to use. So after testing the chips out, and, you know, breaking them open, doing some, doing some uh, cytotox testing, um, I deemed they were safe, and uh, so I used the injector. So this is my doctor, my general practice, just go to the doctor, doctor, um, doing the install. And you'll notice he's not wearing gloves. And that's the moment that I realized or that I learned that doctors wear gloves not to protect you from them, but the other way around. So he, he knew that I wasn't sick, so he's like, yeah, whatever, did it. Um, let's go next. So anyway, I, I did that and then uh, immediately uh, built an access control system for the office and, and uh, like that was it, I was happy. But very quickly, Media caught wind of the story, and, and uh, so I got on the cover of Spectrum, and I wrote a to RFID Toys book that uh, essentially went through how to um, upgrade your stuff. So how to upgrade a keyboard with a reader in it so you can log into the computer. Um, there's me using it. Um, let's see if I can. Pow. Um, yeah, so just there's a computer with the keyboard, and I could log in with it. Uh, also build like a fire safe that you could uh, log into. So rather than doing the PIN code, I could just scan my hand and get in. But all this kind of led to uh, the creation of uh, Dangerous Things, which um, between 2005 and a couple years ago, the maker revolution happened. A lot of people started building things in their garages again, and a lot of people got interested in implantable RFID. And there was all this story media coverage of me, and, but not a lot of information. So I got a lot of emails, but, but really what happened is people started sourcing just, just bad stuff, uh, like unsafe uh, materials and then just kind of ramming it in their body any old way. So I said, that's, that's got to stop. Let's, let's wrap a little business plan around this. And um, so I started the company and then uh, raised uh, crowdfunding for uh, development of the first and only NFC implantable chip. So not only is it RFID, but also NFC compliant. Um, it comes in a little pre-sterilized package. Um, that's, the, that's the back of it. What's nice about it is it's field deployable. I'm, li I'm literally sitting in a field uh, and, and doing installs. So it was a little implantation station. So the install procedure is very easy, quick, uh, and it's easy to do it safe. This is another uh, event. And uh, so what we do is I can't be everywhere, so we partner with professional piercers because uh, they're very familiar with working with skin, safe uh, aseptic practices, and uh, they're professionals. So that works out pretty good. This is a professional partner in Seattle doing an install. Uh, like I said, it's NFC compliant, meaning you can do all the stuff, like get into your house and start your motorcycle and all that kind of stuff, but you also you know, like share V-cards and do all kind of NFC applications, uh, including unlocking your phone. This is the Motorola Skip. It works totally just fine with the chip that I, that, uh, that I have in my hand. Um, Android uh, Lollipop's being released now, and it has NFC unlocking built in. You can also buy uh, just off-the-shelf stuff. This is a Samsung uh, door lock, and I do have a demo. We'll do that later. Um, but uh, you just buy that, put it in your door, and then use your chip to unlock the door. Um, we also work on magnets. So this is kind of the idea of extending senses. Um, so being able to actually take a neodymium magnet and get it coated with titanium nitride, which is common coating used in 
medical device, uh, you know, implants, stuff like hips, rotator cuffs, that kind of stuff. Um, taking that and then, um, oops, too far. Um, basically uh, implanting it in a high sensitive area like uh, where a lot of nerve bundles are, uh, the pinky finger, that kind of thing. It enables you to actually reach out and feel magnetic fields to interact with the world and sense it in a way that you never could before. Um, so the idea of moving an RFID card from a pants pocket to a skin pocket or putting a magnet in logically seems pretty simple, and it is, it's straightforward. But fundamentally and psycho psychologically, it's, uh, it's kind of transforming your idea of, of interacting with the world and experiencing it. And that's really kind of what transhumanism is about, it's what biohacking is about, is to uh, basically take things from, uh, from uh, you know, kind of restorative ideas to into augmentative. So we want to push boundaries and actually be able to do more than, what's, uh, than what we were able to do before. Um, so uh, this was talked about a little bit before, but uh, so this is a, a biohacking type uh, project, it's a wearable that basically has a compass in it, digital compass, it's called Northpaw, and it has a bunch of buzzers around the uh, ankle. And so what happens is when you, when you face north, that buzzer that's on that, in that direction buzzes. And so that's really annoying. It's an annoying buzzing feeling on your ankle. But over time, about two weeks, brain plasticity starts to kick in and you don't feel the buzzing anymore. You just have an inherent sense that you know north is that way. Um, well, I don't know, I don't have it on, so I don't know, maybe it's that way. But, um, but the idea is that your brain can reinterpret that sense. We've, we've taken the tactile sensation and hijacked it and then reuse that pathway to the brain to give it new data. So consciously, you make an effort to say, okay, this sensation on that side of my ankle means north is that way. But over time, that becomes automatic and it's not annoying to you. So what's really interesting is there were several studies done with this type of device or a similar device. And uh, when the users first put it on, it was annoying. Then they start to, started to get this uh, enhanced kind of uh, metadata about their environment that they never had before. So they walk around towns and cities where they'd, they know the city by heart, but they never really knew the orientation before. And so it added this layer of data onto what they already had experienced. But when they removed the, the device, it, uh, it, they had this inherent sense of loss because now they didn't have this uh, input anymore. So it's very interesting what the brain's able to accomplish, even though we're hijacking old senses to, for new purposes. Um, implantable magnets are also interesting because you can do other things with them. So this is Rich Lee, and um, he had uh, two magnets put into the tragus ear, that little protrusion in the ear. Um, and this coil that he has around his neck actually produces magnetic fields that vibrate those magnets, and he can run sound through it. He can basically listen to music or, or have uh, audio uh, play in his ears without any actual thing in his ear. Uh, it's kind of interesting, and again, it's rudimentary, but that's kind of the, the brilliance of this kind of uh, process, the iterative. So this is the proof of concept. The next version will be better and better, and um, we're even talking about doing a tooth implant that'll do bone conduction audio, because I, I have a space for one. So we're gonna see about doing that. Um, so that's, that's it, we blaze through it because we have uh, we have an install here of, uh, of one of the NFC chips that we want to get to. And um, so this right here is the contact information for our Helsinki partner. Um, so after today, we have a special price on, uh, on installs today. So chip and, uh, and installation, 100 euros flat. Uh, but beyond that, it's, uh, it's a little more expensive. So if you're interested, come up after. But we're going to get ready and get set up here. And I can talk through the uh, procedure. Do we have a uh, camera for? Yeah, we're going to have. Excellent. We're going to have a camera coming up soon. But I would love to have Ruben Horbach come on stage. So we have many of these guys over here who have now implants. Also, Martin and Robert is uh, the co founder of um, Quantified Self Europe. He also has now, I think, does he have two implants now? Yeah, so he has two. You have two, so two implantees. Uh, which implants do you have? Well, currently I have one uh, RFID chip in my arm. Um, basically the same one we just talked about with NFC compliance. So I can open my house, access my computer, and uh, do other stuff with it. But I think that one of the most fundamental things about this NFC thing is that we're still in the very beginning of implanted technologies. Uh, I mean, the technology itself, NFC, is nothing new. You use it, for example, in the uh, transit. 
if you take a bus, you put your car to, to it and then you can have access to the bus or you can do mobile payments with it. And in the Netherlands, it's nothing new. Uh, even, for example, the airport, Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam is investigating whether they can shorten the boarding time for passengers. And research shows out that with NFC technologies, you can shave off like half an hour from uh, 45 minutes. So it's, it's quite a lot. And I think one of the projects we are working on right now is to think what kind of practical applications are there for implanted technologies. And uh, the thing what we're doing now with permanent beta, and permanent beta is something I think Martin will talk about in a second, uh, we're trying to get together as much people as we can from multiple disciplines. So we have some doctors, we have um, some uh, uh, students, some teachers, uh, some artists, some programmers, some people from politics in the Netherlands. And we want to bring on the discussion what kind of things can we do in the fields like the medical field, the educational field, the transport section, and all these different sectors. And right now, yeah, the, the things that you showed as in opening doors is very basic, but what, what is there to do with the next evolution, the next step of implanted technologies? So how is this going to evolve, evolve in the next couple of years? Look like 10 to 15 years from now, do we still use implanted technologies? Uh, how is it going to grow? What are the next going to, the features are going to be? It's a um, very new field and it's very cool to actually work in it right now. Yeah, this is very basic level stuff. And uh, you know, in the, in the very near future, I think, the idea of working with transit systems, municipalities, to try to coordinate standards-based uh, approaches uh, for, for not just implantables, but a marriage between implantables, uh, wearables. You know, Apple's got HealthKit going, Samsung has their similar health uh, platform for the mobile phone. I think uh, very, very soon, if not right now, there's people in those companies looking at the, the next version of implantable device. Yeah, I mean, these are basically access controls. Uh, if you look at the United States, for example, there's one company who have an FDA approval to use implanted technologies in the medical field. And what they do, they have an implant, well, not an implantable chip, they have a chip in a pill, and the patient takes the pills, and the pills they eventually dissolve in the stomach and send data directly from the stomach to a small bandage, which converts it to Wi-Fi signal, and then it's going to the doctor on his iPad. And so doctors can in real time monitor whether patients take um, certain medications or if they move enough, et cetera, et cetera. So we are slowly seeing a shift towards an acceptance in implanted technologies. And it's only the beginning, so it's pretty nice. So one thing probably that comes into people's minds, you were talking about access uh, to airports and so on, making it faster. What comes to my mind is to have a piece of metal under my skin is uh, alarm going off. So <laughs> has that happened to you? Well, I uh, fly to London quite fully, uh, frequently, and uh, yes, sometimes this thing goes, does go off indeed. Uh, but then they pat you and they don't find anything, and I probably don't say it to them because then, you know, people can be very strict. And um, I had one guy actually refusing an implant. He was very, very enthusiastic about it, but then he thought he's flying to Israel very, very often, and they can be very strict at the border. So he's maybe thinking about it to do it another time. Yeah, having that thing taken off of you to investigate what's in it is uh, probably not a pleasant experience. So, but so one thing that really comes to my mind uh, as another perspective is this kind of Orwellian kind of uh, world. I mean, what does it mean when you have a barcode on you? Uh, but this barcode is not put by the government, it's put by yourself. Yeah. But uh, what's your take on that? You must have been thinking about this whole privacy issue and uh, the, the perhaps dangerous even? Well, yes and no. First of all, uh, I'd rather have us to do it um, and open source than instead of a company or a government agency. I mean, we totally have to control what we do with it. This chip is totally open source and we can, I can read and write it. So I, can, I have my business card on it right now. So if you want to exchange contacts and you have an Android phone, we can do it. iPhones, unfortunately not. Um, let's talk about the privacy aspect. Uh, we still have our wallets with us. And wallets can be stolen very easy. Um, well, easier than cutting off my arm, for example, or carving the chip out of my hand, God forbid. Um, well, it could happen, yes, of course, but anything could happen. Um, I think from the moment, uh, somebody told me yesterday during the dinner, uh, if we move towards a society where we only pay, for example, in cryptocurrencies, and we have no wallets or no real money whatsoever, then there is a risk that somebody, indeed, gets a big knife and carves it out here. But now, I don't see that shift coming anytime, like soon, I mean, but who knows. How many bitcoins can you store on your hand? No idea. No, no. Infinite. Infinite. Infinite amount of money on your hand. That sounds... I, I, I mean, I'm in, in you know. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think next up is uh, the whole procedure. Um, and uh, while we're getting uh, ready, uh, we also have 
actually the most quantified man in Finland, Pekko Vehvilainen, who's gonna settle our competition of uh, who's gonna be the most uh, technology-driven guy in Finland <laughs> once and for all by being the first to go on for it. And uh, it would be great if, uh, Ruben, you also introduced Tom, Tom in, uh, in the process. And uh, do we have like cameras? Everything is fine. Uh, so uh, good, good to go for that, right? Yes, definitely. Um, well, in Amst don't do it yourself. I mean, the, the, the chips, they come prefabricated in a syringe and it's totally uh, clean and everything. Um, but still have a professional do it. And dangerous things, they work with Piercing Utrecht in Utrecht. It's a city in the Netherlands with uh, Tom van Oudenaarde. And he is by far the best person, I think, in Europe to, to actually uh, implant the chips. Um, not to be modest or something, but, you know. And I just heard that we're actually going to have the heart rate uh, live on stage while we do it. So, Ruben, maybe, uh, or maybe Tom, uh, as a licensed practitioner and so on, and you've been doing this stuff already before, so, so it's not the first time. Maybe you can share some of the experience you've been doing in, in Netherlands. What kind of installations has it been? Well, we've, we've been doing uh, a couple of installations for the permanent beta um, and um, the, the biohacking community in the Netherlands and uh, also uh, for, for Ruben. Um, just similar like this and um, uh, also even bigger audiences uh, like uh, um, um, the, the, what's it called, the summit? Singularity, Singularity University, we did. Um, so uh, I'm getting used to it by now. I, I remember you said that you installed a chip in a theater where there was like hundreds of people at present. So it's something you've done before. Yeah, this is not the first time. Um, uh, so it's a lot of 900 plus uh, uh, people watching. <laughs> Two people fainted. So if if you do, uh, uh, um, if you don't want to see stuff, look away. Uh, <laughs> um, live television as well. So this is not the first one. You're in good hands. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. All right. So, Pekko, wh uh, what made you make this decision? Yeah, the, um, I was chatting with uh, Demo in Facebook like two months ago, and uh, Demo was like, "Hey, good man, that you contacted me. That um, what do you say if we put an implant to you?" It's like, "Yeah, of course." <laughs> and then the second sentence was, "What kind of in implant?" <laughs> so, so pretty cool stuff, and. Um, I happen to be in my previous life, I worked for Nokia and I was the head of uh, NFC for Symbian uh, smartphones. So I know exactly what this technology is all about. And uh, yesterday I saw Tom uh, doing this in insertion to, to one guy, so I think we are okay. I tend to <laughs> faint when I see my own blood, so I hope that there are <laughs> some physicians out there in the audience. And also Tim is holding my iPhone, so we are actually having my pulse and my stress from the ring. Uh, live on screen nice. while while Tom is doing it. <laughs> yeah. So now you are about you were 130 yeah. beats per minute um, when you said that uh, something about fainting. So let's see, <laughs> <laughs> let's see if we get to 180 or 90 or something. So uh, let's let's get started with it. So, so I think it would be great to have Martin also on stage. Martin here. Yeah, here he comes. Yeah, so he's coming over as well. Yeah. So now we're gonna clean up the area, obviously. What is my stress level? Your stress level. Let's switch over to the stress level. Yeah. Absolutely. It's uh, failure. You can have the microphone and. You can start your own session while we do this. Okay. So, so Martin, you had the implant yesterday. It was different than this one. This only takes like one minute to install. Yesterday we had to do like small surgery and it took like 15 minutes. You was the one having it. How, how did it feel? How do you feel today? So the procedure that was yesterday is a different one from today. So yesterday I had a magnet implant and the magnet implant takes a little bit more basically work for the uh, guy doing it to uh, part some of the tissue and insert it really, which is a different procedure. This is something that is uh, being done with a, with a needle, which is similar actually if you've ever done a blood draw in a hospital. Just a moment. It's uh, Are we similar. Getting 
Okay. Yeah. So it's it's very similar to that. Uh, the procedure I had actually is is I compared it to going to the dentist. Um, we have some work done on your cavity because of some sedation. You don't always feel always what what ha is going on. So it's actually quite okay. It's um, uh, it's very brief. It's just a few minutes, but. You want to go ahead? Are you waiting for me? Because I'll you were, just you were, talking. You were one of the pioneers in a way. I mean, not many people in the world had done this when you did it first time. Is that right? Yeah, I had it actually. So there was a group of people. But before that, a very good friend of both Tom and me is uh, Sam uh, Warners, who's in the Netherlands. Who was <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually under the skin and then you're done. It's actually after that. It's very quick. So The... Um, the the pulse is uh, 125. He's still alive. Yeah, so actually, that basically didn't hurt at all. I mean, it was surprising how, how little it felt when it went in. So, obviously, Tom knows his business. So, thanks for that. <laughs> Thank you very much. There was a little bit of stress part. part. <laughs> okay, we can. Yeah. We can see it through the skin. It's right below the the wound. Amazing. So that went very very quickly. But essentially, we take the, uh, the 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 tag itself is two millimeters by twelve millimeters long. It's a cylinder, and uh, what we want to do is we want to make it uh, go into the hand that's basically parallel to the index metacarpal, and uh, just over slightly from it. So about a centimeter away from that. So. You literally just prep the area, you make it uh, aseptic, and you grab the skin, you pull it up, you tent it, and then uh, the injector assembly goes in and deposits the chip, and that's it. It's very quick and, and virtually painless. So what, what's really interesting why this is so, because a lot of people ask, what do you do with it, and how often have you used it? I think there's two ways of looking at it. It can be used for practical use cases, like opening your doors, all of that. But what's really interesting is um, it's it's... For me, and, and also for many others, this early on, it's really about what conversation are you going to have with doctors and others. So I just have been emailing today because Amal and me want to do an MRI with the magnet implant to see what the effects are. Because we'll, we're seeing it as stepping stones to, for example, new technology that will come out. For example, implantable biomarker detection technology that will have real use. But we'll have to have a base of knowledge around that topic. So the materials, how does it affect things like being in an MRI? How does it affect going from your day-to-day -day business? Um, and that's why we're so interested doing that now with relatively simple and, and very clear technology. And then we can step by step go upwards and see where that takes us, actually. That's, that's the most interesting reason for me now. All right. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Pekko. I think we will still stay here for some minutes and it's time for your questions. Time for your questions, questions from the media. Here's Catchbox in front of me. I'm going to draw it to you and feel free to present who you are and what your question is. So just hands up and you can ask questions from the guy who had the first implantee in biohacking events in Finland. Are you scared? Come on. That's one. There's one. All right. Can I throw? Can I throw? It's part of the business. <laughs> uh, I'm Miley Lepol. I'm in functional medicine business, and I, actually, I'm a dentist, so I know what you feel. <laughs> uh, but uh, is that metal? So you were talking about MRI. So, uh, does that prevent you from going to MRI? No. So, the, uh, the chip itself is MRI compliant up to 7 okay. Tesla. Okay. Um, and then beyond that, uh, the, only, uh, the only thing that will happen is uh, an anomaly around it. So, if you had an MRI of your hands, it would just uh, obscure the image okay. in that area. All right. So, no Thanks. heat, no vibration, no okay. issue like that. Thanks. Just throw it back. All right. Next question. I think I spotted it a little bit. It didn't hurt, so that's the obvious <laughs> question. Uh, the, your app was saying relax and breathe and you know, take it easy. So, so Pekka, when, when the other people are thinking about their questions, what are you thinking you will use the chip first? What you will actually put in there? So the other guys have their website address, their business cards. 
what have you been thinking? To put yeah, in there? so the chip that went, went uh, in, into my skin was the uh, it's rewritable uh, information. So basically anything. Uh, we just saw the, uh, some of the applications that we can uh, do. So basically, I don't know how many of you have realized that, but in Finland we are uh, becoming to this um, NFC or Lahi Maksaminen era that we can wave our cards and pay with that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we, we haven't. Uh, the this is not certified product as such, but I would like, like I would love to pay with my my hand, and I, I believe in the Netherlands it's possible to ha pay with bitcoins if you install the bitcoin or not yet, yeah. So uh, for payment is an obvious example. Then um, company called Assa Abloy, obviously many of uh, you know know that company. They have NFC doors so that locks would open if I would put the Asa Abloy key inside my hand now. There are cars like BMW, so that are uh, using NFC technology. So I could basically access my car and start my BMW, but they are not so keen on this kind of like uh, uh, cutting edge technology at this point. But why I wanted to do this myself was that it's, uh, it's, this is safe, and the technology has been existing for 20 years now, basically this NFC technology. <laughs> So nothing to be scared of, nothing strange is happening. This is making my life easier and better because now I can start to put information inside me. My keys are never lost soon. I have a, uh, the demo here. So this is, um, this is a deadbolt uh, from Samsung. And it's just, you buy it and you put it in your door. So you press the button and the lock comes out. Sorry? Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. 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 You gonna put it up on the old screen there? Yeah. I don't know. Well, anyway, so you don't you're not programmed in, so you won't be let in. Yeah. But uh, essentially, press the button, present, unlocks. Just that simple. So you can buy one of these and stick it in your door for a couple oh, hundred bucks. I could try it. Let's you could try it, but it won't it won't do anything. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, let's do it again for just for fun. So you can see the lock come out there. And present tag. Just like that. It's like a magician, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Amazing. Questions. All right, there is a question. It's So for most access control applications like this, you don't actually need to program anything. So uh, a lot of people want to know how many of these doors could you open, for example. So uh, in these scenarios, the, the tag comes with a, what's called a UID, a unique ID. Uh, and then you have additional memory space that you can program. So for this, you would actually just program the ID into the, into the door. So if I had 10 of these, on each of these I would go, hey, add, add this tag, uh, and then just scan it, and it goes in. So you don't have to program it. So for business cards, you just use uh, Android uh, phone or Windows phone. Uh, hopefully iPhone 6 is going to join us eventually. But um, yeah, there's a, uh, applications, tons of applications that, that write NFC uh, tag writer from uh, NXP is a good one. And uh, yeah, you just put your contact info, write it, and then it's done. Anybody? More questions? Now rip all the information out you possibly can. Uh, how about the comfortability? Have you had any, any issue that, that sometimes it's starting to ache or you're stretching out? Are you doing sports or something and, and it's right. been like, ouch, damn, I have this thing. It's blocking me now. No, the, uh, so the, the question was, you know, basically, is there any kind of issue? Do, yeah. do, do you have any problems? So um, I've had this uh, since 2005, uh, so 10 years, and there's been no issues. It, essentially what your body does the, the, the chip goes underneath the skin, the dermis layer, but above muscle tissue. So there's a layer called the fascia. And so it gets put right there, and then your body will encapsulate it with fibrous tissue. And that encapsulation process takes a couple weeks. So during that two week period, two to three week period, it kind of feels like twitchy and maybe itchy a little bit, but after it's healed up, it's, it's no problem at all. I would say the only issue that uh, I've ever run into 
is uh, I, one time I closed my car door and I ran the car door, the edge of it along this part of the hand and it just pinched a little bit. But it was like, eh, whatever. So we've had martial artists, um, rock climbers, musicians, uh, firearms people uh, all use it and they report no problems. In fact, the one, one case we had where a, a, a guy actually, in the Netherlands actually, he, um, he, f he was falling and he reached up to a doorknob that had, it was an L shape, and he reached up like this and the doorknob put a lot of pressure and he felt a pop, it was like, and he thought he broke the tag. Uh, but what had happened is it didn't actually break, it forced out of that fibrous tissue, and it popped out of it. So he had it removed and we looked at it under microscope and it was all fine, no, no breaks. Uh, but that was the closest we've ever uh, had to a report of a problem. In fact, we took the, uh, the chip design to the University of Washington in Seattle, and we had a special crush machine, like it just crushes things. And uh, we put, uh, we've injected raw chicken with different tags in like close to bone and in muscle tissue. And then we put the chicken in the crush machine and crushed it. And uh, it, the machine only, it, it like went up to 500 newtons, but I even at the maximum like pressure, it still wasn't breaking the tags. So it was, uh, and then we th threw them into like liquid nitrogen and put them in a vacuum and we tried to break them and it was really, really hard to do it, so.